So let's talk battlesuits, drones and high-tech weaponry, and talk about what the Tau Empire can do in Warhammer 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking Tau, and we're going to do an army overview of the faction in 9th edition, talking about what our cast-driven warriors of the greater good can achieve on the tabletop. We'll start by going over their army's strengths and weaknesses, the core rules for the faction, and some of the strongest rules in each section of the codex. We'll take a quick spin through each and every one of their units, and finish up with a couple of tournament-winning army lists. Loads to talk about, so let's suit up and jump right in. So Tau have had a bit of a rocky road throughout 9th edition. When the edition first launched, they were easily one of the weakest factions in the game. Perhaps the main contributing factor to that were the missions and terrain, a lot smaller tables with more terrain on it, and a mission format that meant that you couldn't just shoot your opponent dead and then claim the objectives, you had to get stock in early, which Tau generally don't want to do that much. Then their codex dropped in early 2022, and they went from one of the weakest factions in the game to easily one of the strongest, a ridiculously powerful shooting army that could just remove entire chunks of the enemy army without too much effort, while being very, very mobile as well. Since then, though, the faction's taken a fair few nerfs. They had the balanced data slates, which changed a few things like Montcar, and removing core from broadsides, and then Warzone Nephilim hit with a fair few other nerfs as well, lots of points bombs to their best units, and it seems to have pushed Tau into being a far more mid-tier army again. Currently in-game, I think they can still compete well. Their win rate in Nephilim is a little bit on the lower side at tournament games, at 46%. That's still easily high enough to keep up with the middle of the pack though, and for some reason it seems that Tau seem to be extra good at actually taking podium spots and winning events. Despite a slightly mediocre win rate like that, a lot of people do seem to be having good success with them at the highest levels of play. Currently, despite their reputation as a bit of a gun line, with the current missions, it seems like they're an army that isn't super easy to pick up for new players, but when mastered, can perform very well indeed. For the strengths of the army, obviously tower all about the guns, as they don't really do melee that much, but in general they've always tended to be a fairly mobile firepower army, particularly with things like Cold Star Commanders, fast-moving crisis suits, and Montcar, it means that you can have units zipping around the board quite quickly and getting important lines of sight, kind of important if shooting is the main tool for gunning your opponent off the table. In terms of units, most armies seem to build around a core of commanders and crisis suits. With their great warlord trait and buffing abilities, they still seem to be very efficient and dangerous despite the points nerfs to them. Crisis suit blobs can be very tough and also very dangerous. Besides that, they have a fair amount of other very solid supporting data sheets, hammerheads, sunshark bombers, ethereals, and screening crew units all seem to see a lot of play. And there's plenty more besides that that's maybe a little overshadowed but still very, very usable. On the other hand, for weaknesses though, I say that their codex internal balance isn't super great at the moment. While they certainly do have unit options that are usable, I think you could argue that a fair few of the other data sheets in the codex are just rather subpar, particularly things that have got nerfed quite a bit. In particular, now broadsides lost core, most of the synergies only really make sense to be applied to crisis suits, which does feel a bit limiting. Tau being Tau, they don't really have all that many melee threats. Can be a little bit awkward, as some situations are just better dealt with in melee than at range, but Tau you only have range, and planning exactly what needs to die from their firepower can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. Often Tau detachments want to run multiple commanders, as they're one of the strongest data sheets in the codex. It can lead to some slight CP issues in Nephilim. A lot of armies seem to use multiple patrols to get multiple commanders in, and that could leave them a little bit on the CP light side at the start of the game. Finally for Tau, I think they are kind of lacking in durable options to jump forward and take the central objectives and then not die. Crisis suits can be kind of tough with some drone support and things, but still they are rather valuable units to be having taking the brunt of the enemy firepower. I do feel that it means that Tau armies might struggle a little bit more for primary objectives, at least compared with a bunch of armies that have really tough things that just sit on objectives and take enemy punishment. First up though, let's go over some core Tau rules. Perhaps first and foremost, they have their tactical philosophies, Montcar and Kaoyon. You pick one at the start of the game. They both give you a damage boost within a set range. Montcar applies to turn 1 to 3, and it also allows you to advance and shoot as if static. And Kaoyon is turns 3 to 5, and it allows you to fall back and shoot at minus 1 to hit. They do do have a few other synergies and benefits elsewhere in the codex, but just based on these rules alone, I do prefer Montcar to Kaoyon. Generally speaking, it often makes more sense to get more damage done in the early turns, and that mobility that you can get with Montcar is really quite impressive. Even slower tower units can be making good headway around the board while still remaining accurate. Still though, since Montcar's AP thing went away, 
Now I do feel that they're a little bit more balanced. Carry On does give you a bigger damage buff in those later turns, though often it doesn't matter quite as much how much you kill on turn 5, it's more about jumping on objectives and just scoring things. Next up, you couldn't really talk about the tower without marker lights. The way they work is that marker light units do an action. For footbound marker light units, it typically sacrifices their movement, but for things like vehicles, drones and pathfinders, they can still move and marker light. When the action's done at the start of the shooting phase, you pick an enemy unit to gain a marker light within 36 inches on a 3+, plus, and then you can expend them one by one for a plus one to hit for each unit that targets the enemy unit affected. Just for including one thing like a marker drone and potentially giving plus one to hit for a massive battle suit blob, I do think they're pretty much too efficient not to include, but I'd argue that you perhaps don't need all that many of them to get very good use out of them in an army. In the current competitive list, quite a lot of people like to use marker drones attached to their commander units, that way they can remain screened by lookouts uh, while still hopefully firing off a few marker lights. A few people seem to use marker drones hidden in crisis suit blobs, you might not be able to fire them all the time if they're advancing, but if they're not then it could give them a bit more self-reliance on the plus one to hit. And now quite a lot of tower lists seem to have discovered the Sunshark Bomber since Nephilim. They seem to be very commonly played in top lists, and these also come with a marker light. I still think things like Pathfinders and marker drone squads are kind of usable, but they're not that tough and can be directly targeted, which can be a bit of a problem if your opponent tries to remove the marker lights. Otherwise, for special rules that are common to quite a lot of units, Ambushing Predators is the Kroot one, which allows them to pre-game move. Quite nice for getting some expendable things up the board to screen and take objectives early. Battle suits in the tower list can fire in melee as if they were vehicles, taking a minus one to hit if they're firing heavy weapons. And drones are really quite common throughout the codex. They have a whole bunch of special rules which basically mean that they're treated more like war gear than warriors. They're ignored for lookout sir, ignore morale tests. They can't do most actions bar marker lights. They're ignored for unit toughness which is quite nice. And besides their actual war gear and effects, they have that save your protocol stratagem as well. One CP after you've failed a save to basically make the damage go away and the drone die. Really quite big that that happens after saves in my opinion. It means that you could fail a crucial invul save and then just basically say no. It's far more powerful than a command point reroll that you do sacrifice the drone. Next up, let's go through the individual rule sections of the codex and talk about some of the strongest things that are most likely to appear in top tower lists. First up, we've got their fun upgraded weapons and war gear with the points cost prototype systems. Basically you pay for the standard gun and then you pay the additional points on these to upgrade them with additional firepower and fun abilities. Perhaps one of the single most popular ones of these is the DW-02 Advanced Burst Cannon. This one's 15 points over the standard model and jumps up to a big 8 shots at strength 6 AP-1. Really quite a solid upgrade of anti-infantry firepower. It also has a fairly fun ability to ignore any abilities that ignore wounds. So it cuts through things like feel no pain and it could potentially deal additional damage to things with damage caps such as Katan. It seems to be particularly popular paired with Precision of the Hunter allowing you to stack a lot of saves. Maybe particularly so on a cold star battle suit backed up with their high output burst cannon. Otherwise another fun commander upgrade is the Thermoneutronic Projector. That's 20 points over a standard flamer the same D6 plus 2 shots at strength 4, AP minus 2 and damage 2. A lot more bite than a standard flame of that one and it's fun that it also has the same sort of bite in melee as well, potentially making a tower commander punch actually fairly decently, particularly if you combine it with precision of the hunter again. Next up there's a couple of debuff ones I quite like, the dominator fragmentation launcher is 25 points for a boosted air bursting fragmentation projector that gives the target minus 4 leadership. Leadership debuffs are sometimes a little bit underwhelming in 40k, but minus 4 is really quite a big one and very easily applied. This one certainly has the potential to be worth the points, either to make the enemy fail at a leadership and lose some valuable models, or even just force them to spend the 2 CP to auto pass. The Resonator Warheads are a upgraded missile pod, 3 shots at strength 8, AP 2 and damage 2, and they also make a unit move a lot slower. That one is quite a pricey upgrade to be fair, its damage output isn't super great, though very general purpose, but I do like the ability to slow movement, could really mess with a valuable unit getting into the fight. Finally, and a very common pick for the points cost are the Stim Injectors for 10 points. It's a very cheap 4 plus feel no pain save for a turn. These ones are often used on a tanky battle suit in the middle of a squad of crisis suits to give you one unit that can tank a lot of fire before it goes down and the rest get targeted. At 10 points, I think it's usually going to give you a very decent amount of durability. 
Out of these, probably my favourite are the Burst Cannon, the Projector and the Stim Injectors. Next up, we've got the Invocations of the Ethereals, and I don't think that these are particularly well balanced in that there's two really obvious picks, since Broadside's Lost Core, Crisis Suits are really the main target for these. Sense of Stone can give them a 5 plus feel no pain, which is pretty excellent in terms of boosted toughness. And then I think most players typically want to follow that up with Wisdom of the Guides to generate a CP, if you can keep the Ethereal alive for the entire game. That could easily be an extra 4 or 5 command points if you roll okay. If you're taking one of the upgraded Ethereals or the Relic, then you'd have the option for one further invocation, and often people seem to pick Zephyr's Grace for that, to allow you to double down on the survivability buff. That one bestows a minus one to hit on the unit if they're moving, and sometimes that could be really relevant if you just absolutely need, say, a crisis unit to survive. Might potentially be worth passing up on the command point for in the right circumstance, depending on what the opponent's army is about to shoot it with. Stratagem's next, and here I'll just focus on things that are fairly generic to a fair few units in the army, and maybe mention any of the relevant unit specific ones later. First up, for one command point, there's two different variants of minus two to charge in the codex, either for infantry or battle suits, and I think these have really good value if your opponent is just about to make a long charge, say if they were charging out of deep strike and needed an eight or nine with some special rules. Putting that up to a ten or eleven could easily keep your suits out of combat, which could be a massive deal. For one CP, coordinated engagement is a nice way to gain extra AP. You need two sept units to focus fire on an enemy unit within 18 inches, and all their attacks get one AP more. That one definitely has the potential to be massively valuable, say if you get that on a big unit of crisis suits, maybe armed with something like burst cannons or cyclic ion blasters. I think dynamic offensive is a good one. A crisis unit advances 6 inches automatically, and takes no penalties for shooting after doing so. That basically guarantees you a 16 inch movement which could get you to objectives reliably or get your line of sight or range on something that you need. Could be one to consider first turn. We've already mentioned saviour protocols, often going to be worth it to just mitigate the damage with a drone if you have one in the unit. And it's nice that you only have to commit after the save has been failed, potentially guaranteeing that you save some damage. Finally, again for battle suits, we have strike and phase, 1 or 2 CP. And this one's basically jump shoot jump for battle suit units. If it makes the difference between a unit being exposed and killed next turn or hidden and safe, this could very, very easily be worth the CP, whether it's on something like a commander or a big block of crisis suits. Moving on, let's talk about some character upgrades. First up, we have the Warlord traits, which I'd say is quite a strong section for the Tau. Basically, all of these are really quite good, and the far side one isn't bad either. First up, Precision of the Hunter allows you to re-roll all hit rolls and wound rolls. Pretty excellent on any commander packing 3 or 4 weapons to start with, even more so with things like those prototype flamers or the prototype burst cannon. It's also the one that you could use if you wanted to build that melee commander as well. Use this, the Thermoneutronic Projector and the Orange Gauntlet, and you've got a very punchy commander that can also shoot very hard indeed. Next up, Exemplar of Kaoyan is Shadow Sun's trait. So often quite relevant there, as she has to be the warlord if she's present. This one's a pre-game redeploy of 1-3 to three units, and even redeploying one big scary crisis blob can be pretty intimidating to be honest. You could either keep it completely safe from your opponent if they've deployed smartly, or get in the perfect position to alpha strike if you get first turn. Obviously even better if you think that you are going to be committing to Kaoyan. Exemplar of Montcar on the other hand is really good as well. It allows you to buff one unit nearby to reroll wound rolls, for a single core unit attacking enemies within 9 inches or 12 in Montcar, and again it's just a pretty phenomenal shooting buff that you can get on any big crisis unit, though it does mean that you have to get up pretty close. Otherwise, in a similar kind of vein, there's through Boldness Victory. Again, you apply that to one big core unit, quite likely a unit of crisis suits, and that unit gets sixes to hit auto wound, a little bit less powerful than Exemplar of Montcar for the amount of damage that it does, but quite nice that you can apply that at any range, so you could have it for a crisis unit that's going to stand off a bit. Both of the last two seem to be pretty good on crisis commanders, or even on a hover drone ethereal that's following around a big unit of crisis suits. Next up we have the relics, which I'd say maybe aren't quite as strong as the warlord traits on the whole, but there's still plenty of them that are very usable. First up, the Orange Gauntlet gives you strength 10, damage 3, melee with good AP. It turns a crisis commander into at least a fairly credible melee threat, should at least allow you to punch one or two elite infantry to death with that, and more if you take Precision of the Hunter, which does work on this. Next, there's two rather good defensive systems, the Begel Hunter's Plate, which is plus one to saves and a five plus feel no pain. Two absolutely great toughness upgrades there, really nice on something like a Cold Star Commander winging around 
that might take some enemy fire. And there's also the solid image projection unit as an alternative. That one gives you a 4 plus invul and allows you to ignore one failed save per turn. That one could be pretty good if you absolutely have to have four different ranged weapons and means that you don't need to have a shield generator. Otherwise, the humble save I think is pretty much auto include if you are running an ethereal that isn't a character one. A 2 plus to cast the invocation plus an extra invocation basically means he's over twice as good. I don't think that there's much point in running a standard ethereal without this relic. Finally, potentially to save some command points, there's the Pure Tide Engram Neurochip. That's a 3 plus chance to refund a CP on battle tactics or epic deed stratagems each turn. Kinda depends on just how much you're planning on using those, but 3 plus CP regeneration is at least somewhat reliable. I think in general all of these are nice to have, but maybe not strictly auto include. Even the humble stave you could get around by using one of the character ethereals. Finally, before we get into tower sets, we have the secondaries. Tau get three of their own unique ones, and out of those I'd say that only two of them are really worth considering, aerospace targeting relays and decisive action. From looking at Tau tournament stats, it seems that tournament players tend to take both of these the majority of the time, though of course mission and matchup and exactly what army you're playing with might have some bearing. The aerospace targeting one basically gives you objectives on the midpoint of each board edge that you need infantry units to do an action on. Those objectives will be really quite far out the way, but Tau are quite mobile and should often be able to get to them. I would say that this one does require a little bit of setup though. You need to have fast moving infantry units in the list to really consider this, and if you don't then you're probably going to have objectives out of reach. Decisive action I think is also very very solid though. Basically the game is to control half or more of the objectives in each of the turns of your tactical philosophy. You only have to do it at the end of your turn, so that's usually going to be very achievable, particularly on missions with an even number of objectives. You get 4 victory points for doing that each turn, so it does cap out at a maximum of 12, but unless the opponent has seized all the objectives and you're really on the back foot, that should be a fairly reliable 12 points on quite a lot of missions. Moving on, we come to the Tau Sept, and currently I'd say that the strongest two are the Tau Sept and the Farside Enclaves, pretty much the two most iconic ones in the book anyway, and both of them incentivize you to do slightly different things with their lists. First up, Tau Sept really does have quite a lot going for it. Their base trait gives them slightly better character buffs, and a single reroll each time a unit shoots, quite good for things like hammerheads and other really big single shot units. Otherwise, just on their standard Sept things, they have a 2 CP for plus 1 to wound against one key target. Really good if you need to bring down something absolutely massive, maybe a big brick of Terminators or a Knight or something. It's really strong when it could be affecting quite a lot of Tau units. Their Relic upgrade as well, the Vector Maneuvering Thrusters, are pretty good for a 2 inch extra movement and basically making them unchargeable because when the opponent charges them they get to move. That could be great insurance for a Cold Star Commander venturing up the field. Really though, I think perhaps one of the single biggest draws to the Tau Sept though are that they get 4 really quite unique, strong and usable characters. Long Strike, the character Hammerhead with an improved Ballistic skill. Commander Shadow Sun with her big rerolls, 4 reroll all hits on a Crisis Blob. Dark Strider for really quite a cheap buffing infantry character for how many points he costs. He gives you plus one to wound against one unit, which is big. And finally, Ornvar the character ethereal, who doesn't really cost all that much more than the standard one and gets you two plus invocations without you having to spend CP on the humble stave, plus it's harder to kill. We'll get onto an example tower sept list later in the video. Next up though, we have the far side enclaves, also seeing a lot of play in tournaments. Their Sept's Tenet gives them boosted damage up close within 9 inches post FAQ, plus again a single reroll which is handy for hammerheads. Perhaps one of the single most powerful things for the Farsight Enclaves is that they have the drop zone clear stratagem, that's the one where you deep strike some crisis suits, and then for a 2 or 3 CP stratagem they casually get reroll all hits and wounds, usually meaning that they're going to be firing about twice as efficiently as they normally would be. Pretty mad, particularly out of the Alpha Strike. Otherwise, I think that their character upgrades, the Relic Talisman for a bit of psychic defence, is well worth it. Plus, some people seem to like the Master of the Killing Blow. That's a Warlord trait that gives you the chance to deal some extra AP, and again, not to have your wounds ignored by anything else, things like Feel No Pain or Hard Damage Caps. Finally, and again, perhaps one of the biggest draws to playing Farsight Enclaves, is that you can take more than one Commander Battlesuit in each detachment, at the expense of taking any Ethereals. As mentioned before, commanders really are pretty great, one of the stronger data sheets in the codex. Often Tau armies seem to be spamming multiple patrols to get more, so not having to do that in the enclaves isn't bad. You also do get access to Commander Farsight himself, who is really quite fun with his Dawnblade for some meaty melee. 
though it does seem that most competitive lists seem to be leaving him at home, he tends to be a bit more of a fluffy, unfond pick. Otherwise, briefly whizzing through the other sets, maybe the next most interesting one competitively might be Bor Khan. Extra range across the army is really quite nice, plus there's an ignores involve stratagem that you can use to get some big damage through on something like a Storm Surge. Night players certainly wouldn't want to be fighting Storm Surges, with the ability for them to potentially remove the entire knight in one round of shooting, no involves and no questions asked. Otherwise, I think that the rest are probably considerably weaker. Delith gives you a lot of synergy with auxiliaries, so if you want to make a crude mercenary meme army work, then they're the ones to go for there. Sakir gives you durability at range and an ignores cover stratagem. It's not nothing, but it's just considerably less than Tau or Farsight. Viola that gives you a little bit of extra movement and a fun 2 CP mortal wound strat, plus you can take Orn Shi for another ethereal who can cast invocations on a 2 plus. Finally, for the custom sets, I think most of them don't really offer anything that the big sets don't do better. Perhaps the most interesting trait out of any of them, though, might be that plus one strength at close range. It can get some of the crisis suit weapons to some interesting breakpoints. Things like the strength five flamers really are a lot more biting. In general, though, at the moment it seems to be Tower and Farsight ruling the roost, Borkan coming in third, perhaps. So next up, let's go through the Tau unit pool. We'll start out with battle suits and vehicles then go through infantry and drone units, and then on to characters. We'll start out with the most iconic units in the codex, and perhaps the single most important unit to usually build around, Crisis Battlesuits. They went up in points quite a bit in the Warzone Nephilim update, but they still remain an absolute staple of the army, the most efficient and mobile unit that you can put massive buffs on. They can be really dangerous, really tough and really mobile, and most lists include them in a decent number. They'll often be fielded in units of five with supporting character buffs, particularly ethereals and hover drones, the various different flavours of commanders with their warlord traits like Exemplar of Montcar, and often have a marker drone or shield drone or two in tow. A few more ablative wounds and the ability for saviour protocols is quite nice. With the crisis suit weapon loadouts, I would argue that still literally every single one of the weapons remains usable depending on what role you want for the unit, though perhaps some of the most common picks for all-around damage dealing would be the cyclic ion blaster and the plasma rifle, it seems kind of hard to go too far wrong with those. Both of them give you some pretty efficient damage for the points, I think. Perhaps the missile pods and the air-bursting fragmentation projectors are perhaps the most niche weapons out of the bunch. The missile pods pay a big premium for being general purpose and long range, and the airbursts are a fair bit weaker after that barrage nerf. Crisis bodyguards were initially very good for their character shenanigans, basically paying a few points extra for the bodyguard type rule. In general, for most lists, I consider them a bit niche now, I'd rather just run the standard suits. If you're playing very heavy on the commanders, though, I think they could still be potentially worth it. Otherwise, for the other units with battlesuit keywords, stealth suits are pretty useful as for deployment units. Their damage output isn't all that great, but they can get on midfield objectives and do actions and things early, plus have that ability with a homing beacon to deliver a deep strike crisis suit unit turn 1, which can be pretty game-changing for the alpha strike. The Ghost Kill and the Riptide, I think both have kind of okay defensive profiles, but just aren't really all that good in terms of damage dealing. The Ghost Kill has its fun rule where it can't be shot at long range, so it could be good on a far-flung objective marker. The Riptide generally tends to struggle compared with other long-range firepower options, things like Hammerheads at the moment. Broadside Battlesuits were initially one of the kings of the Codex in terms of firepower when the book dropped. Now they lack the core keyword and got put up points, and their barrage got nerfed though, the shine's really been taken off them. They don't seem to be run quite as much in competitive lists, though I still think that they have a bit of a niche for the cover of plasma rifles and a heavy rail rifle. Their points for the damage output with a marker drone support isn't really too bad at all. Moving on to vehicle keyword units, and they're some of the strongest units in the codex here. The Hammerhead Gunship and Long Strike both are really quite common and scary in Tau lists. The rail gun might be very swingy, but its ability just to chog straight through inball saves no questions asked is pretty powerful. A lot of otherwise durable units will feel the pain quite hard when they're hit by one of these. Particularly nice in Farsight Enclave or Tau Seps. Having a few of these lurking in the backfield doesn't seem like a bad choice. I'd say the Sky Ray is probably a little bit inferior to these on balance, though I don't think there's actually as much in it as you might expect. The damage output isn't that far behind, and it does come with some marker lights and is cheaper. Devilfish I think are solid enough. The plan would generally be to load a few units of them with breachers, and then they've got a fond stratagem where you can zoom them onto midfield objectives, unload the breachers, and the breachers can move and shoot, perhaps one of the better ways of delivering tau shooting units to the midfield objectives, and they do have obsec as well. 
Next up, it seems that the Sunshark bomber has really come into its own. I must admit it was a unit that I'd kind of underestimated before, but now it seems that most of the most successful tower lists are actually running a pair of these bombers. They're just over 160 points as a flyer, and put out really quite a lot of damage to shooting, plus some decent bomb attacks, and pack a marker light, and those interceptor drones can detach if needed as well. Kind of interesting that they were so rarely seen before the update, but now are everywhere now. I guess when a lot of good stuff gets nerfed, people look for other options. Comparatively, the Razor Shark just doesn't really compete that well. Lacking those mortal wound bombs is quite a big deal. Otherwise, in the vehicle section, Piranhas are okay skirmishers, but I'd say aren't particularly outstanding. Their fast movement is maybe one of the biggest things, but it's not like Crisis Suits or Cold Stars don't move fast. Storm Surges were really quite efficient, but then got really quite a big points nerf, so they aren't as much anymore. A bit more interesting in Borkan when those big shots can punch through invuls. And finally, I'm not going to go through every single Tower Forge World unit. In general, though, I'd broadly sum them up as pretty badly balanced and in need of some points changes. Out of all the options, maybe one of the most interesting might be the Tetra, just a fast-moving marker-like platform that's also a vehicle that could do things like engage on all fronts. In general terms, though, people just don't seem to be using Forge World Tower things at all in competitive lists. Next up, we've got infantry, drones, and alien mercenaries. In the troop slot, there's the two flavours of Fire Warriors, the strike team with the pulse rifles, and the breachers with their close-range pulse blasters. The strike team are perhaps okay backfield objective holders, though I wouldn't say particularly outstanding in terms of either their defence or their damage. The breaches are perhaps the more interesting of the two, the best contents for the devilfish. Zoom them forward, unload them with the stratagem, and then they also have that stratagem to get bonuses to wound when they're up close, and that can be really quite devastating. They aren't all that tough though, and they are a little bit CP heavy to make work. It seems that by far the most commonly chosen troop slot tends to be croup mercenaries at the moment. Very cheap for 10 bodies. They can bully light infantry really quite well, both at range and in melee for the points cost. They've got a pre-game move and can be at least a little bit tough when they're in cover. Though in general, they don't really have all that much going for them on the durability front. Basically want to hide out of sight on objectives where they can, and maybe jump out and surprise some light infantry with their strength 4 attacks. Otherwise, for infantry and drone units, we've got Crute Hounds. Really very cheap and basically do what Crute Mercenaries do, but in tiny little units that are very expendable and you don't mind about losing. If there's going to be units that you're going to be trading on objectives, then these guys are pretty nice. And they can just do a bit of move blocking or deep strike screening without too much worry about if they die. Vespids have some okay anti-infantry shooting and they can be quite helpful for secondaries. Maybe dropping on those aerospace markers or doing a bit of retrieved data. Tactical drones don't seem to be massively favoured. They are a little bit on the pricey side and people seem to prefer running these in crisis blocks or attached to commanders. That way they can't be shot quite as easily. Perhaps the most interesting use might be small units of marker drone tactical drone squads. They can move and shoot and put out some marker lights without too big investment. Pathfinders, on the other hand, do require quite a bit of investment for the unit. Kind of a premium option if you do want mass marker lights or some special weapons. I think they have okay utility and actually fairly decent damage output if they have special weapons, but the issue is that they just die to a stiff breeze. Once they expose themselves to do their thing, they will get shot off the board depressingly easily. Otherwise, there's sniper drones and the fireside marksmen. Perhaps their most interesting thing is that they can't be shot unless they're close, so I guess you could use them to camp backfield objectives if you wanted to. Their damage output isn't super strong though. And Crutox Riders are an okay disposable unit for just 25 points. For the points cost, their range and melee threat I don't think is too bad, but their cavalry keyword does limit them a bit, and they rarely feel like all that much of a necessary unit compared with all the things that you want to cram into a Tau list. Finally, we have the leaders of the Empire and the Enclaves, and I think it's fairly safe to say that the Battlesuit Commanders are some of the rock stars of the Codex, getting some of the fanciest toys, decent damage output, and also having some really good buffing options as well. Out of the three flavours of Commanders, people tend to prefer the Crisis and the Cold Star battle suits. The Crisis one can have the suits advancing around the board, ignoring the penalty for moving and shooting, and can also provide some insurance about getting tags in combat, so they can fall back and shoot as well. The Cold Stars get their fun high output burst cannon, plus an absolutely great move, and can lead the Crisis suits on really quite big long advance moves to get them up the board quickly or into range when they need it. I think all of them are worth considering either shield drones or marker drones on. They provide a decent amount of durability and can potentially give you some hidden marker lights. We've already talked about a lot of the builds and buffs that they can get. In general, things like cyclic ion blasters and plasma rifles are good. 
People really like the DW02 burst cannon and the high output burst cannon on cold stars, particularly combined with precision of the hunter. He can also make that fun melee build as well with the Onager Gauntlet and the Thermoneutronic Projector. Otherwise, there's a couple of character commanders as well. Shadow Sun is pretty solid for a tower army. Maybe doesn't do an enormous amount outside of a full reroll to hit buff, but in a powerful shooting army when that could apply to a big crisis unit, that's all she really needs to do besides chip in a few fusion blaster shots. Farsight, as mentioned, I'm a touch more underwhelmed with. He does provide some melee, though a lot of people seem to pass him up just for more generic commander datasheets. For Ethereals, I think that any of the three are pretty usable. They want to be getting the 5 plus save and the command point regen going on, and the 5 plus feel no pain is really nice on crisis blocks. The standard one is nice with the hover drone and the humble stave, she'll be able to keep up with the crisis suits a bit better. And Ornvar and Orn She are good in their relative sets, particularly Ornvar if playing Tau Sept, as he's pretty tough to take out and also doesn't cost CP. Otherwise, for Tau Sept, as mentioned previously, Long Strike is a nice alternative hammerhead with a 3 plus ballistic skill. Dark Strider can give you a plus 1 to wound, plus has some nice other things like a marker light and a bit of shooting. The card of Fireblade, I think, really does lose out to the commanders and the ethereals at the moment, mainly because the Fire Warriors just don't tend to be as strong damage dealers as the battle suits these days. If they were better, then he'd be better. And finally, the Crute Shaper, I actually don't think is really all that bad for 25 points. For how much you pay, what you get really isn't too bad. But again, Crute aren't really a unit that you typically want to use for damage dealing, so don't really need his rerolls. So it's just kind of hard to see him as any kind of necessary unit, unless you're going for a bit more of a fluffy Crute build. Overall, just to sum up after the data sheets, in general I'd be tempted to use Croup Mercenaries for troops, have a decent amount of Crisis Battle Suits supported by Commanders and Ethereals. For extra damage dealing and fire support, I'd be quite tempted by things like Sunshark Bombers and Hammerhead Gunships, and maybe a few other interesting screening units could be used too, things like Stealth Suits, Croup Hounds, or perhaps Breachers and Devilfish to take some midfield objectives. Finishing up then, I thought we'd just take a look at two tournament winning tower lists, which there have been a fair few of recently. First up, we've got a Tau Sept list, this one by Quinton Johnson, who uses it to take first at the Grand Onslaught GT. I feel like this one's really quite representative of some of the strongest things that Tau can take, and leans quite heavily on the Tau Sept special characters. The list is made up of two patrol detachments and a supreme command for Shadow Sun, and leading the army there's three commanders, and it's largely buffing two huge units of Crisis suits. We've got Shadow Sun, who's the Warlord with the high energy fusion blasters. She can make a unit reroll all hits. There's a Crisis Commander with three cyclic ion blasters, the Thermoneutronic Projector, two marker drones, and Precision of the Hunter. Really quite a lot of AP-2 damage output coming out of him. Maybe could be an interesting choice for that plus one AP one when combined with another unit. There's then a Cold Star Commander with two plasma rifles, a high output burst cannon, the DW02 burst cannon, and two marker drones. Those commanders can also provide some innate re-rolls to the battle suits, plus get them moving around the board while firing out those weapons very accurately. There's then an ethereal with a sense of stone, wisdom of guides, the humble stave, and exemplar of Montcar. Very solid for getting a 5 plus feel no pain, and also the re-roll wounds thing on one of the crisis units. I think I have managed to miss it on the list there, but he is also equipped with a hover drone as well, which will allow him to keep up. Finally for HQs, there's Long Strike with a Railgun and the Accelerator Burst Cannons, very solid backfield fire support. In the troop section, there's two units of Croup Mercenaries, cheap screening units for objectives and pre-game moving if they want, one unit of four Croup Hounds, very cheap, very expendable. And then we get on to the two absolutely massive bricks of damage in the army, one unit of five Crisis Suits with Burst Cannon, Cyclic Ion Blaster and Plasma Rifle, they take target locks to ignore cover. And then one unit of five crisis suits with cyclic ion blaster, plasma rifle, and second plasma rifle. Again, they take target locks, besides one suit that takes an iridium suit, stim injector, and trades the cyclic ion blaster for a shield generator, basically being a tanky battle suit to take all the damage, and hopefully keep his mates alive. Finally, there's two sun shark bombers, winging around dealing mortal wounds, and chugging out a whole bunch of damage to firepower. Overall seems to be quite representative of the big chunky crisis suit units with some other scary support and dangerous commanders. I imagine the main challenge of the game would be trying to keep those crisis suits alive and functioning, using their good movements to get good shooting on the enemy, while also keeping them as safe from reprisals as is reasonable. Otherwise, seeing as they play quite differently, I thought it might be fun to take a look at one strong Farsight Enclaves list as well. This list was by Oliver Smith, 
who used it to take first at the Iowa Open GT. This list contains two different Farsight Enclaves patrols, and interestingly it's gone very very heavy with the commanders, no less than three Cold Star commanders. It doesn't look like it's going to be a list that's suffering for fast moving, hard hitting firepower. The first Cold Star commander is Burst Cannon Central, two Burst Cannons, the High Output Burst Cannon and a Thermoneutronic Projector. That one has Precision of the Hunter and two Marker Drones, so it gets to re-roll those hit and wound rolls. There's then one with the DW02 Burst Cannon, a High Output Burst Cannon and two Plasma Rifles. That one takes the Talisman for a chance to deny the Witch and also the Exemplar of Kalyon to allow you to redeploy a unit or multiple units if the list chooses to go with the Kalyon philosophy. The last cold die slightly longer range, a missile pod, two plasma rifles, and a high output burst cannon once more. That one takes the Nova Surge plasma rifle, a prototype system that allows you to ignore invuls for quite a big points cost, and Master of the Killing Blow that allows you to ignore damage caps and things. That one does seem like it's almost like an assassin type thing to deal with things like Abaddon or Catan shards. It could be quite reliably dealing you an extra three wounds on one of those targets that most tower lists wouldn't be able to do again in the shooting phase. Then the crew support seems fairly similar, two units of crew mercenaries and this time two units of four crew hounds, a few expendable bodies to hold objectives and screen the enemy. This time the battle suits are going with a very different approach though, much more multiple small units and probably running around with the commanders. One unit of three that takes burst cannon, cyclic ion blaster and plasma rifle, they take target locks and the stim injector and I do wonder whether or not they might be a unit that's planning on deep striking in and then using the stratagem to reroll all hits and wounds. They do seem quite optional for doing that on 2 CP. Then there's three units of Crisis Bodyguards. I guess they'll be following the Cold Star Commanders around, which is why they've paid the premium for the Bodyguard rule. One of them has Cyclic Iron Blaster, Fusion Blaster and Plasma Rifle, and two of them has Flamer, Burst Cannon and Cyclic Iron Blaster. Finally, for support damage output, there's again two Sunshark Bombers. Seems to be a really common staple in lots of the successful Tau lists, and also two Hammershead Gunships with Rail Guns and Gun Drones, for a bit of anti-tank ignores inball goodness. Overall, a very scary list all in all. I do feel that this one again would need some very careful play though, as Cold Star Commanders are all enormous threats, but if they're exposed and shot by the enemy, they're going to go down very quickly. There's not really anything much in this list that's particularly tough, so you need to make very clever use of terrain and getting in the right threat ranges to make sure that the enemy doesn't hit you back too hard and just wipe you out. So with those two strong lists done, I think we'll leave it there today for the Tau. In general, I think an army not in too bad a place, can compete with the mid-tier armies very nicely, and has the potential to punch up hard against some of the strongest armies in the game if the stars do align for them. If you've enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics. I'll certainly be aiming to cover more armies in Nephilim in a similar manner to this, plus I'm sure we'll have more news for the Tower Empire somewhere down the line. Finally, if you have been enjoying the videos on the channel or finding them useful, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page, and that's how I can afford to keep the videos coming on the channel quite so regularly. If you have been enjoying a lot, any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, an absolutely massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.